Hello and welcome to Ways to Change the World. I'm Christian Guru Murphy and this is the podcast in which we talk to extraordinary people about the big ideas in their lives and the events that have helped shape them. My guest this week is perhaps most famous now for a podcast, but is also an actor, a comedian, um, an improviser, if that's the word, um, and now a writer because she's done a book um, associated with the podcast, which is Grief Cast. So I'm talking about Carrie Ad Lloyd, whose book is called You Are Not Alone. Um, welcome. <laughs> now, um, Grief Cast is sort of a cult thing, isn't it? I think in its, uh... <laughs> That's always a polite way of saying not necessarily massively popular. <laughs> well, but no, it is popular, it. But, but it's also a club. I and mean, you refer to it yes. as a club. Yeah, 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 definitely. So maybe you explain what it is. <laughs> Sure. I'm Christian Guru Murphy. Welcome to the podcast. Uh, so Griefcast is a show where I interview people about their experiences of grief and death. It started out with me interviewing comedians because that was my world and they were people I had numbers of. So I could text them and say, do you want to do my podcast? I've been doing it for nearly seven years. So it's moved on to all sorts of people, writers, producers, public figures, I suppose. And we're nearly done 200 episodes, 10 seasons, and yeah, I never expected it to be this part of my life yeah. at all, at all. It was not, I didn't set out thinking, right, that's it. I want to stop doing live comedy and I want to do a podcast that's about death. <laughs> that's not what I started. But um, I suppose the reason that I do it is, the important thing is that my dad died when I was 15 of pancreatic cancer. And so I joined the club very early, as I like to say, got there, put the nibbles out, got the Pepsi ready and the LucasAid. And... I've had spent a long time talking about death, so I felt like I could continue to talk about death. So wh when did you start the podcast and why? So I started in 2016. Now, you have to remember, Christian, in 2016, podcasts were for comedians. Like, they were the only people doing them. No one took them seriously. It was like oh, a way to be more funny in a different space. And in 2016, I was pregnant with my first child. And I'm an actor as well, and so I wasn't getting much work because I was quite heavily pregnant. And I was walking down the road and I was thinking about all oh, my friends had launched all these podcasts. And I thought, go if I had a podcast, I'd just talk to people about death. And then I thought, that's a terrible idea. That's a terrible, terrible idea. No one would listen. How depressing. And then I don't know if you have this with ideas, like it just kept appearing. Like every time I thought, what should I do? It just kept being like, me, do me, do me, do Griefcast, do do. And my daughter was um, two weeks late. So I had this like two weeks where I had already sort of recorded these conversations but didn't really know what to do with them with four of my friends really. And then because she was late be arriving, I just learned how to edit a podcast, put it out there and then thought, brilliant, it's done. I can just do something else. And then the email started coming in and that's when I realized, oh, this isn't just me that wants to talk about. It's actually hundreds of people want to talk about grief and I kept getting these emails saying similar things like I didn't know other people felt like this I thought I was having a breakdown what you're describing is grief I realize now I'm just grieving I've never told anyone about these feelings and because I'm so embarrassed about them and I started reading them and thinking oh my god like I thought there was about 10 of us but there's actually loads of us when you when you had the original idea did you think that this was something for you because you had to get something off your chest no or... no 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 yeah, no. <laughs> you thought this would be a good idea for a podcast? Yeah, I just thought... Because that's quite visionary. <laughs> <laughs> well, I am, I am somebody who... I have ideas and then I tend... If I do them, I don't, I don't think about them too much. If that makes sense. It's like I don't analyse why that idea is there. And if I had have done, I would have thought, well, this is probably about you and your grief. But I just thought, no, I just think that's something I can do because I have spent 20 plus years talking about grief to people, you know, at parties or socially being like, oh, you in the, oh, me too, me too. Um, and so I knew I had this sort of weird set of skills. Like I was someone who could do that. And I did not think at all it would be helpful for, for me at all, at all. And then as it went on, I was like, oh, <laughs> clearly someone needs to talk about this. And I sort of realized, oh, as in this is kind of therapeutic. Like I am now talking about my grief on a weekly basis. Um, and so it started to, it was very painful, but it started to help me unpack a lot of stuff. And then I'm guessing a publisher came to you and said, by the way, do you realise you've got loads and loads of free research for a book? Could you write it down? <laughs> oh, no, no, <laughs> they didn't. Uh, what kept happening was I would have a guess. So, you know, as we moved on from series after series, a guest would say something and I'd be like, oh, do you know who else said that? Episode three, episode five, episode, um, you know, 92. 
And I was sort of always having to connect all these dots to people. Or they'd tweet me and say, oh, do you have any episodes about um, estrangement? I'd be like, oh, yeah, I've got this one, this one, this one. And they all say kind of this. And I got a bit, not frustrated, but a bit like, oh, this is quite tiring, having to constantly be the Wikipedia of your own show. And I thought, oh, I wonder if I could put it all in a place. Then it'd be like, this is all the things I've learned, like everything that's come up again and again. So tried and tested. These aren't like unique situations only applicable to one person. Like we all felt like this and we all felt like this. So I wrote a book proposal. Can you define grief? Because in approaching this, I, because I don't feel like I have grieved because mm -hmm. I've never lost anybody very close to me. But, but what is grief? Grief at its most basic is the feeling of loss when something you love is no longer there. You ha Pure grief, I suppose, the, the original, the OG, is the loss of a person. But you can have what's now called sometimes as like secondary grief or disenfranchised grief, which is like the loss of um, a country if you have to move, the loss of a relationship. So there's, we're all part of the grief club. My... Um, chapter if you like is dealing with loss of people because there's lots of people who deal with the other griefs but my, I mainly deal with when someone you love and that doesn't necessarily mean you get on with them or you have a good relationship with them that absolutely doesn't have to be the case but someone you loved very dearly or was important to you in some way dies there is an extreme pain which can't really be summarized in one emotion it's lots of things at exactly the same time it's it's pain it's sadness it's relief it's upset it's regret it's anger it's all of these things flying at you exactly the same time and for me that's what grief is and and so do you feel that you are still grieving even though your dad <coughs> died when you were 15 even though it was ages ago mate god you're still grieving um so it's interesting i guess we have to reframe what we mean by grieving which I try and do in the book. But what I think we need to reframe is that what grieving looks like. So grief will always be a part of my life because my dad is a fundamental part of who I am and he's dead and he died. Like that's the thing that happened. So if you say to me, are you sad that that happened? Yes. Do you miss him? Yes. Is that something that you carry with you daily? Yes. Do I wake up every day and <laughs> I have no daddy? Is there a picture of him framed in black lace? No. Like that's not what grief looks like. So I think when we can try and get past this idea of what we think grief looks like, yeah. especially if you're not in the club. So when, we, when I say, yes, I'm still grieving... It's not, I wouldn't describe myself in active grief, but it's definitely something that I, do I still carry my grief with me? Yes. Will I always do that? Yes. It's a lifelong, lifelong process. I mean, I asked you to, to define it because I think the way we have all been conditioned to think of yeah. grief as something that you, you, that is a process you go through and it ends. <laughs> yes. That's, that's, like, that's like my bugbear <laughs> is like, if you're not in the club, and this is, this is great. And that's why the book is for people not in the club as well, because I think people just, just don't understand. But we all know people who have lost someone and have seen the pain they've been in and been like, oh, God, that looks really bad. And we have this idea as humans, because we love linear narratives, that grief ends. And what we're looking for is beginning. This person was in your life. Middle, it was great. End, they died. You, now you get over it. So... What we have to stop looking for is the end, like literally like the end of a book, the end of a film where everybody's fine and they feel the same way. If I had gone back to feeling the same way I did before my dad died, that would be actually very strange because that would act like he had no importance to me. Uh, his relationship had no effect on me and his death had no effect on me. And that's odd. <laughs> so why are we seeking to go back to this point pre their death where everything was fine? Why aren't we doing, which is what most people experience in grief, is that you learn to live with the pain. You grow your life around it. The pain is always part, like a part of you. It's there. It's like a scar. You know, you, you hold it. You might walk a bit differently and it might be a bit tender occasionally. But it doesn't stop you living your life or having joyful experiences or laughing and all of this other stuff. So if we can stop looking for grief to disappear, to just go, it becomes a lot easier to carry. And that's what I learned on the show. I spoke to all these people, some of them further ahead in the journey than me, some behind me, but all of them said the same thing. I'm still sad about it. And I thought, well, if we're all still sad about it. Then we're not doing it wrong, are we? We're doing it like this is normal. We're, this is what grief looks like. It's something you'll always carry with you in different ways, you know. Because, I mean, I suppose that must be the other affirming thing about having interviewed so many people about this is that you know you, you might also go well I was 15 so of yeah. course I had a different experience of 
yes. grief yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, to, to, what, to, what, to what you might expect. So, so what difference did being 15 make? So I am what I call a member of the TGC, the Teenage Grief Club, which is like a subsection of the club. And teenage grievers, it's obviously it affects you in a very particular way because I wasn't fully formed as a person when this fundamental loss happened. So it will always define me in a, in a certain way in that, you know, I hadn't, I hadn't finished the conversation. So me and my dad didn't have a particularly great relationship anyway. That's the other thing I should add. Well, people, you were 15. Well, no, no, not even before that. Because right. people think when I do this show in this book, they're like, oh, she was like, must have really loved him. Must have been like real daddy's princess. Like that's, she's not over it. And I'm like, no, no, no. We had a really quite bad relationship pre-teenagers. We didn't really get on. He was a really difficult guy. He was really mad. Really, really <laughs> quite a character. And then I was 15, so it had got worse. And so we hadn't kind of come through to the bit where you're like, okay, I'm an adult, you're an adult, let's try and work out how we're going to be in a family together. So someone leaving at that point is very difficult because you're almost mid-conversation. And as a teenager, especially, you're not listening. You know, you're not absolutely not like prepared to hear their side of the argument. And, you know, there's certain aspects of the teenage club that... Um, are particular to the teenage club. But when I interviewed all these people, what I realized was everybody has something. So you can lose someone at 35, but you're about to become a father. And that's what becomes a definement of your grief. Or you can lose someone and then you immediately have to care for another parent. And that's what defines grief because you never got a chance to grieve for the, the other parent because you immediately had to become a carer. Or you lose your job or you break up with someone. So I think this is the thing of like what I want everyone to do and I say in the book, I call it personalize your grief, is take a look at what happened to you when this massive event happened. Because that massive event was affected by the, where you were at that point in time. And as soon as I accepted, you were 15, that made it really hard to actually put, use the vocabulary of what was happening to you. So you couldn't, so you buried a lot of it. And you became absolutely terrified of death. So I didn't go off the rails. I like stayed at home watching Gardener's World. So that was like my reaction to it. <laughs> my brother was much cooler. Like he went off the rails. Um, and it's, it's like being kind to yourself, genuinely kind to yourself and genuine accepting that when something happened to you, you were at this state and that state will affect how the grief starts appearing rather than the shoulds. <clears throat> As you said, I was only 15, so I should be over it by now. Or I was 35. I didn't know them that well. I, I hadn't met them properly. Or, you know, I, I had a lovely relationship with them and they were 88 and I got to say goodbye. So I should be fine. And all these shoulds make people, it makes it harder to grieve. Your dad died from cancer. Yes, pancreatic so, cancer. So, so did his death dominate your late teens? Like, did it dominate your conversation, your thoughts, your feelings, your... So it didn't dominate my conversations unless I found someone in the club. So if I found someone who was like, oh my God, me too. Like I just lost so-and-so. Then we would have this like, do you feel like this? Do you feel like, I feel like this? Oh my God, me too. And that is what I tried to capture back with Griefcast. Because I was like, people in the club want to talk about it desperately and they're not allowed. Whereas Griefcast became this place I could say to someone, come in, say their name, and we're going to talk about them for an hour. I'm not going to tell you to change the subject. You know, I'm just going to let you talk about death for an hour. No, so, so I mean, so I suppose I'm trying to work out how you got from there, there this to, terrible traumatic, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, experience to becoming a comedian. <laughs> Sorry. Well, so my family used humour a lot in death. So my dad would crack jokes. My mum is very, like, that's the way she, if you don't laugh, you'll cry, is basically what she always says. Um, and uh, that's her sort of go-to, <laughs> is to crack jokes. So we cracked a lot of jokes. I've said this before, but my dad at one point pretended to be dead before he was dead when we came to see him. <laughs> he thought it was really funny. Me and my mum, obviously, were like, what? Why How would you? Long? Just, to Just like we story. came in the room and he like pretended to be like at the hospital where he was basically dying. He pretended to be dead. And we were like, oh my God, oh my God, like it's happened, we weren't here. And then he was like, ah. And... We did not think. I was not in the mood that day. I was like, it's not funny. <laughs> like, now I can see, you know, he has a certain sense of humour to it. Um, and so when I was, um, you know, late teenager into my 20s, this was so painful what happened to me. It was so buried, so over here, and I still didn't know how to talk about it. So I did comedy, but the comedy would always be rife with grief like it would always like leak out of places like all my characters had like these weird dad figures that weren't there and I used to play Andrew was a, a seven-year-old stand-up 
whose father had run away um, because of tax evasion. And now he had a really bad, dodgy stepdad who was horrible and he used to do terrible stand-up. He'd always be saying, my daddy's coming home. <laughs> like, it doesn't take Freud to work out <laughs> what was going on there. So I hid it in humour. And then I think what actually happened to me is when I got pregnant in 2016, I had to reconcile this 15-year-old this me that I had preserved, because that's who my dad knew, with like the thir- mid thirties me that was pregnant, I had to sort of go, oh, I'm, I'm not 15. Like, this is real. This is actually where I am. I'm having a baby. I have to talk about this. Like, this is who I, this is what's real. And so once I started doing that, I didn't need to dress up anymore and smear lipstick on my face and pretend to be a fake Zoe Deschanel called Joey Bechamel who used to like hit on the men in the audience. Like I did, like, it just suddenly felt like all these characters didn't need to be there as much anymore and I could be carry out and say oh I'm in so much pain and I would really love to talk about it with other people who understand it and aren't going to try and make me pack it away so the comedy hid it for a long time and how, how did you get into the comedy um I went to university with Sarah Pascoe and then when we left uni we both wanted to be very serious actors and it became apparent that that wasn't happening and we would audition for things so we wouldn't get it and she dated a stand-up and she took me along to a night and she said look at this, we could do this. And then I discovered this thing called character stand-up. You didn't have to be yourself, thanks to a comedian called Pippa Evans. And I thought, um, oh, I could do that. I could stand up and pretend to be someone. But I'd always performed. Like, I'd always done school plays and drama and improv and stuff. And I then started doing lots of improvisation and um, then did a one-woman show in Edinburgh. And, yeah, that just became my job. But I, you know, it wasn't the intention as ever. Sort of what was the intention? Oh, to be a serious actor, to be a proper actor. Doing and that had always plays. been the intention? Oh, yes, very much. Yeah, from a child. Like, I thought, yes. I, my parents took me to see lots of Shakespeare and Chekhov and, and Tennessee Williams. And so I thought that's what, I thought that's what proper, the, that's how you did it. I didn't know. Was that both of them? Or, yeah, 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 they were both very into it. And um, I was obsessed with things like Who Signs It Anyway and Red Dwarf and Blackadder and... Um, Wooden Walters, but I didn't think that was available to me. I thought that's, you know, those lucky people got to do it. That's not, you, how do you do it? I just didn't know. And then I fell into it in the way that many of them did of going, oh, I can't really do this, um, this Shakespeare thing, but I can, every time I do it, a play, people are laughing. So perhaps I should do the comedy thing. And, and during the course of that, how present was the loss of your dad? Not being in the audience, um, not seeing the success. As anyone grieving will tell you, it, it hits you at weird points. And so when you have big successes, there's definitely that moment. I've interviewed um, Felix White, who was in the Maccabees, who lost his mum when he was 17. And he said, it's those moments when you think, oh, I'd love to, oh, I'd love to call them and just tell them. I don't, they don't have to come back, but just say, guess what I'm doing? You would, you would love this. And um, yeah, Jimmy Carr said the same thing. He was talking about his mum and how he's saying like a lot of what he does is because he thinks, God, my mum would have loved this. And I definitely felt it when things finally, you know, when the comedy finally became a job and I wasn't a permanent temp working on reception because I was really bad at that. And so that was, didn't need to call him about that. <laughs> about that. And um, I think when I, I guested with Whose Lines It Anyway, which is a show we all loved, I guess with them a lot, I do like, I guess with the comedy store players who are amazing improvisers, um, but they brought back the sort of Who's Line gang and they did a show in Edinburgh and they asked me to guess with it, which was like the show in my family house. And my brother said, God, he would have he'd lost his mind at this. <laughs> like, this would have been absolute like that you're here with them. And that's when I thought, oh yeah, he would have. But when you join the club this early, you're very prepared for that. I mean, he, he didn't know he didn't know what my GCSEs were. He didn't know that I left, you know, school with okay grades. He didn't know I went to university. He didn't know I got married. He didn't know I had kids. So you get used to this. It doesn't stop it being painful, um, but you definitely get prepped. Prepped. I'm not someone I know from talking to people who've lost parents, like in their you know mid twenties or early thirties, and they say, "Oh my God, you know, like not going to be meet my kids." I'm like, I've had a long time to think about that doesn't mean that when it happened it wasn't very painful that I thought oh god he's not going to be here that's really sad but it wasn't a shock shall we say. So we had Greg Wise on talking about his experience of death and his his whole um, interview was really about how we need to be talking about death Mm. while we're alive yeah and and to get 
you know, get over the things we find scary and talk about process and, you know, whether you want to be buried or cremated yeah, and yeah. what you want played at the funeral and <laughs> where the money goes, all those sorts of things, what you want to do if you're in pain, all those sorts of things, all the nitty gritty of dying um, needs to be normalised. Um, what, do what do you think of that as a way of making it, you know, do you think any of that would make it, makes it easier to deal with death? Or is that just all good stuff to do? Bit of both. <laughs> Bit of both. It would be amazing if we did that. I can't guarantee you anything. I don't know you, but I can guarantee you, you're going to die and you're going to know someone who dies. Now, isn't it crazy that you, when it happens, may, you won't because you're going to read my book, Christian, so you're going to be okay. But like, you may have no idea what death looks like, what you're supposed to do, how to sort it out. Not everybody goes to university. Not everybody buys a house. You know, those are things like you have to kind of re research and Google and figure out. But everyone is going to experience this. So, like, literally, why aren't we talking, why aren't we talking about it? And I know it's scary, but what I said, what, this is my lived experience, okay, 200 episodes. Everybody's person who had a plan, who at least had said, look, I want to be buried, or this is the music, bare minimum. I want this played, I want to be buried. That's your minimum they've told you others might have said if I'm in a vegetative state I want you to turn it off this is what I want you to do if I have a stroke this is my organ donation other people you know there's more detail but the people who had something I would say in the six months after that person died 10% easier to deal with doesn't mean they're not sad doesn't mean they don't have to grieve but like all the crap that comes with someone dying was a little bit easier. If you love these people in your life, do you want, after you die, do you want it to be a little bit easier or a little bit shitter? Because that's the option you're giving them. Either they come to your death and go, oh my God, we don't know what they wanted. Well, he said 10 years ago, make cremated. Well, he said to me two years ago, bury. And they have a route. Like, or do you want to go, oh, he wrote it all down. It's all in a piece of paper. And it just says, I want to be buried. Here's, here's the person I want to do the reading. Here's the, you know, music I want. And I would like you to do this. Because COVID showed me that funerals matter. Like before that, I would have been a bit cynical and gone, oh, you know, is there rituals, whatever. It, they matter. Not necessarily religious, but this ritual of how you deal with someone who's died is really important. And if you know what somebody wants or how they want to be cared for when they're in extreme medical pain or their you know brain isn't working you can love them and care for them a little bit easier and if you don't know you have to make those decisions and you may doubt that you've made the right one because it, it often occurs to me that our actual process of funerals um is a bit fake <coughs> what do you mean well in the, <laughs> we, we we have these big services for mm -hmm. people in which we all say how much we love them and how amazing they were, and there's a picture up, and there's a speech, and there's this and that. And then you go off to either a small burial or a small cremation. Mm -hmm. And that that's often, the ones I've been to, are totally different yeah, you know, yeah. in, in, in their feel and um, not celebratory in any mm. way. Um, so, uh, Do you think we kind of need to, throw up in the air a little bit our rituals. Well, I think it's really interesting that you would use the word fake because what you're describing is the public persona of a person. So people who knew them kind of okay, want to come to their funeral, want to celebrate them, but a bit weird if they're at the crematorium weeping by them. Is it? Yeah, I mean, well, look, hey, let's talk about your funeral. Like, there'll be people there who really, who knew you, want to be there, but like your immediate family. They don't want to see the body burning. Well, yeah, the immediate family might need a moment to be sad because what you're describing is grief. We have a moment where you go, they were amazing. We really love them. And then they have a moment, the people who are really affected by that death need to come together as a small group and go, yeah, those people can walk away from this and they'll be sad for a day. We are really sad. and We need a moment to connect with each other and go, we're not just, oh, he was great. We wish he was still here. And that that's life. That's like, we all have these circles, don't we? Of like the people who really know us, sort of know us, definitely know us, actually really even know everything awful about us and they still want to stand next to us. And everyone needs their own ritual. And that's what happened in COVID. Like, you know, the ritual became only the extreme, only the extreme, like the 12 people who knew you and they were very sad funerals because you didn't get to have the bit where you went, but let's at least acknowledge all the brilliance that they had and all, you know, my dad's funeral, he was 44 the younger they are, the bigger the funeral, it was packed. It was packed full of celebration and it was like a party and everyone kept saying, God, he would have loved this. He would have loved this. Shame he's not here. Mm. And then we went off 
to a crematorium, which I've almost blanked from my mind because it was so much more painful and sad. But did I need both those things? Yeah, I think I did. And I think it would have been weird just to have one and be like, oh, we're just celebrating and I don't get to cry. And then horrible not to have the bit where we go, he was a great person and he, and he affected loads of people's lives and let's remember that. You mentioned your brother and, and different uh, responses and I've heard you say that, I mean, he's got a very different response mm-hmm. to you. And, and I mean, do you ever wish that you had his response? <laughs> I've had enough therapy uh, to to accept how I respond. I used to. I definitely used to feel, especially when I was very, very angry and he wasn't as angry. I think, God, I wish, because no one likes angry people. They're not fun. You don't want them around. You don't want to help them. You mentioned therapy. And um, and obviously therapy is brilliant for loads and loads of people, but it's very hard to access oh, yeah. if you can't pay for it. Yeah, it's a nightmare. Yeah. I mean, so is there any shortcuts? to therapy (laughs) in a world in which you might have to wait three years to get a referral to therapy? Well, I I can't defend the NHS mental health social care system. It's a mess. I was very lucky. I got help through the NHS, but they said to me, (laughs) they said to me, you're going to have to wait two years. I was like, he died when I was 15. Like, I I can wait. I'm 35. It's fine. Like, so, but I was very lucky. I wasn't in an emergency case. You know, I didn't need immediate help. And I had learned how to muffle it and carry it and squash it down so I was like I'll squash it for two more years don't worry but I do acknowledge and I say that in the book like you know I'm privileged enough and eloquent enough and all the rest of ness enough to navigate that system when the door was initially closed to me what I will so how long did it take it took two years right and I went on every course they gave me. They said, well, you can't have therapy. You have to go on a CBT. I said, fine, I do CBT. And I came back, so I'm still not great. They said, well, you have to do mindfulness. I said, okay, I'll do a mindfulness course. And they said, well, you have to go on a low self-esteem workshop. I said, fine, I'll go on low self-esteem. <laughs> I literally just did, like, I'm an actor. I'll do any free workshop you say. This is training. I did everything they said until eventually they were like, okay. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> we'll put you on the waiting list. And then they, want, they rang me two years later and said, congratulations, you're at the top of the waiting and list. And how much did you have? I had like a good, uh, a good couple of years of NHS therapy, and I was supposed to have a year, but she said this seems quite a lot. <laughs> she said, "I think, I think we might need a bit more." And I said, mm, "Okay, that's not great news, is it?" But I'm glad. And now I, now I pay for my therapy, so I've had both. Um, but what I try and say in the book, because obviously, as you said, it's a real privilege, and also some people don't want to do it. You know, that's the other thing. Some people have the money and they don't want to do it. So it's, it's not a it's not the answer to everything. And it's definitely not a shortcut because it's one of the most painful things I've ever had to do. But the biggest thing I think with grief is, is talking. And that doesn't have to be to a professional. And there are, of course, amazing services like Cruise. It's an amazing service. They offer free bereavement counselling, like for when you've you know, just lost someone and there's Samaritans and there's um, the Grief Network, Let's Talk About Loss, who are like meet up, free meetup services for young people. So there's like a lot of resources these days that are out there. But the biggest thing is not keeping it all in, all those, those thoughts of the grief. That's when you get in trouble because grief lights up the same part of your brain that lights up in depression. And it, you know, it's not a mental illness, but it makes you feel very isolated. It makes you feel like no one cares. That's why the book is called You're Not Alone because like you feel alone. And you feel like no one else gets it. And in a way, that's true because grief is completely unique. So no one else will ever completely understand. But there's lots of people who you have like meeting points with who lost someone to cancer, who had so, or got a phone call in the night or um, didn't get on with their dads and now are dealing with grief. So you need to find people in your tribe, in your gang. And I think that can be really helpful. And how, how do you think people should approach a friend, a child, a parent, whoever it is, yeah. who has absolutely no desire to engage with what you're saying (laughs) and has no desire to to hear you say what you really need to do is talk about it. Yeah, yeah. Um, What What, do you do? It's fair enough. I think you have to listen to them. Like, you know, here's me saying, look, this is what worked for me. And I say in the book, like, it's a roadmap, but like all maps, I'm not telling you where to go. I'm just showing you the map. Like, it's up to you what you do with it. If somebody says they don't want to talk about it, they don't want to talk about it. But the key with grief, especially I would say with young grievers, particularly teenagers, that doesn't mean forever. So what I see a lot is people go, oh, I text them, but they said they didn't want to talk. Did you text them six months later? Like, did you text them the day of the funeral? And that's why they were like, I don't want to talk today. So grief evolves with the person in the same way that we evolve as people and we change. Your grief changes with you. And I can't look at my grief as I did as a 15-year-old. I can only look at it as where I am now. So 
what I always say to people is keep checking in. You, I mean, you've been doing this now for what, seven years mm-hmm. nearly? Um, do, do, you, do you worry that, you know, how, how long you can carry on doing <laughs> I, this? Are you I'm, asking me if I'm okay? I'm not okay. No, I mean, like, you know, like I mean, because I'm sure to some extent doing this keeps pushing the door open again yeah. to some degree. Yeah. Um, like, do you think you might pass the baton on or do you think <laughs> you might just carry on doing this forever? I don't know. Is an honest answer. I... I never expected to be doing it this long, ever. My original plan was to do 52 episodes because I thought then you've got one for every week of the first year. And the first year to me was the worst. So I thought, well, that's good. And then I didn't realise people don't listen to podcasts once a week. They listen, they binge them. So people would message me, like, I've done them. And I was like, well, I, I gave you your first year. <laughs> and then I think for me, there's definitely going to be a break now for my own mental health. And that's why I wanted to get it out of here and put it in a book and be like, this is everything I've learned. This is what all the club members have said to me. So if you're in the club, hello, you're not alone. If you're not in the club, this is how to help. And yeah, you know, I'm still continuing to do comedy and acting and my show Ostentatious and make sure that I'm not just talking about death, but I am okay with that being something that's a part of my life. And for a long time, I would be like, it doesn't matter, it's no big deal. Dad's die, so what? And I'm like, yeah, he died. It was quite, it was quite important. I don't mind talking about it. And if you could change the world in any way, how would you change it? I would. <laughs> I would introduce death studies by law in school. And I would get people in school to understand that there is a thing called a will that, you, that we should all um, talk about and understand about. And there's a thing called... Still haven't done my will. Oh, Kristen. There's a thing... I only did mine recently. But, um, there's a thing called advanced care planning that you can put out. You can literally fill out a template about what you want to happen. I did an amazing episode with Dr. Catherine Mannix where she literally explained to me what happened to the body when it dies. She explained that like 20 years after my dad died. I had listened to a body die and I didn't know what was going on. And when she went through it, I realized, as many listeners of the episode did, that my dad was not in the pain that I sometimes thought he was. If we could teach at school, like, this is how you help people, this is what a body looks like, this is the preparation you need to do, then this would not be such a frightening thing. And, you know, I know lots of people have this conversation about the things we don't learn at school, like mortgage applications or like what tax actually means. (laughs) Lots of, lots of people could learn that, couldn't they? Um, but I think the idea of grief studies or death studies just being one module where you just get to say, it will happen to you, and here's some things that will make it less scary. Carrie Lloyd, thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you for sharing your way to change the world. Thank you very much. <laughs>